Okay. This morning we're going to take a take a short break from uh, from the King James version, and we're going to talk about the doctrine of baptism. I think this is going to it'll piggy tail pretty well with what I preached. Well, it was two weeks ago here, um, and it will was last week la last week in in uh, out in Las Vegas, um, and that's the doc the doctrine of baptism. It's been a couple of years since I've taught on this um, and, and so I want to go over it. It'll probably take a couple of weeks to get through it. I've expanded it a little bit from what we did in the Essential Bible Doctrine. Uh, not a lot but a little bit um, and, and so I, I want to lay this out really well so that we can so that we can learn about it. Now if you add up all, if you look in a concordance and you run all of, and you look up the word baptize, baptize, all the different forms of it and then subtract all of the all of the those names of John the Baptist, okay? Because that's his title, not his not his uh, not, not the the actual act of baptism. Um, there's right at a hundred references, a hundred references to baptism. Most of them deal with water baptism, with immersion, with baptizing people and bringing them into the church most of there's 23 references that speak of something other than that out of the out of the roughly hundred now there are 14 times that the word in its various forms refers to Christ's sufferings uh, and there's the passages Matthew 20 20 through 23 Mark 10 38 through 39 and Luke 12 50 you will find that in those passages it's dealing with Christ's sufferings. You remember the sons of Zebedee had, had, um, had, had come to him at one point and they wanted to sit on his right hand or on his left. Um, and in that first passage, Matthew 20 and verse 22 says, You know not what ye ask, are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? Well, that clearly is not talking about water baptism. That's talking about the sufferings that he's going to go through. And the passage in Mark is a parallel passage to that. And the passage in Luke refers to the same thing. It's talking about the sufferings that Christ was going to go through. It has nothing to do with water baptism. Okay? Then we have two times it refers to baptism with the Spirit and with fire. These are both occasions, they're parallel passages, and it's occasions where John the Baptist is speaking. Uh, the one in Matthew 3.11 is where it says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Okay? That's not water baptism. Jesus was not out baptizing people in the River Jordan. John the Baptist was doing that. This does not refer to that, and I'm not going to get into what it does refer to in this lesson, but it, it should be fairly plain, the difference between the Holy Ghost and fire. It should give you kind of an idea. Um, four times it refers to baptism with the Spirit only. Um, and this refers to that same passage that we were just looking at. Mark 1.8, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. 
Acts 1 5 for John truly baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence Acts 11 16 which was at the home of Cornelius when Peter was at Cornelius's house and he said then remembered I the word of the Lord how that he said John indeed baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost and then again in John chapter 1 and verse 33 it refers to the one that will baptize with the Holy Ghost and and that one is referring to Jesus Christ so again this does not deal with water baptism this is dealing with a different type um, we have one time that it refers to the baptism of Israel unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea I'm sure you're familiar with that passage I land on that one a lot talking about when they crossed through the Red Sea and that was likened unto a baptism as they were leaving the world and pressing into the kingdom of God going through the water to get there it's a symbolic passage in that in, in that sense um, one time it refers to several baptisms over in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 2 verse 1 uh, mentions leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ and, and pressing forward unto perfection and in verse 2 it talks about of the doctrine of baptisms and the laying on of hands and so forth and so on um, so that's one time there and the last time it refers to baptism by the Spirit into the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12 13 for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body I'm sure you're familiar with that with that passage so those that's all of the those 23 passages other than the ones that refer to John the Baptist himself and and using that as his name if you will or title um, all the rest of them deal with water baptism with the idea of water baptism and that's what we what we want to look at in this series we want to look at the who the what the why the where the when the how of water baptism who's it for what is it why do we do it where do we do it when do we do it how do we do it that's what we want to look at the idea of water baptism what it is and what it accomplishes now to start with we want to look at the fact that there are five properties of a valid water baptism five things have to be present five things have to be included in water baptism or it ain't a baptism okay just because you get in a pool full of water and you get wet that does not mean that you've been baptized there are five things present that are required according to the scripture otherwise it's not a baptism okay and I'll, and I'll give a couple of examples as we go through this the first and probably the most important is this a proper administrator you have to be baptized by an ordained minister period if it's not an ordained minister it doesn't count we had a we had a guy in uh, Las Vegas one time years and years ago some of you know him um, that had been quote baptized by his mother who was a charismatic um, preacher of sorts uh, and he argued for years that he didn't need to be rebaptized that he'd already been baptized but he hadn't she wasn't an ordained minister of anything I've I've seen here now with the with, you know with the day of FaceTime I, I see a lot of people that are baptized by their parents you'll have one of these big even in Baptist churches of all places I've seen where they'll have these big baptism services and they'll go out and and kids will be baptized by their dad well, their dad's not a minister doesn't count it counts for a bath I guess if you want to take a bath in your clothes then you know you can do that but it's not a baptism it has to be an ordained minister now let's prove it with some Bible verses Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 through 20 Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. Notice that teaching comes first. Now, I'm going to pick on the Roman Catholics again to baptize babies. How much teaching do they do to those babies before they, before they baptize them? At an infant baptism, how much teaching goes on? You're supposed to teach 
then baptize. Teaching comes first. And we'll get into what you're teaching in a few minutes. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. There's the Trinity. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. You know, there's a lot of people that take this verse to mean that, um, that this was given to just anybody. That everybody that's a Christian, it's their duty to go out and evangelize the world. But that's not who it was given to. This is one of those passages where you have to pay attention to context. Now, understand, there is a modern hermeneutical system out there in which they define words by the context. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about defining words by context. That's commonly what you will find taught today in most colleges. The words are defined by what the word is. The word boat is always going to mean what the word boat means unless it creates a contradiction somewhere else or an absurdity somewhere else. The word is taken in its primary meaning. I couldn't care less what the context is. But it's important to pay attention to context so that you know who you're, who it's being, who's being spoken to. In this passage, can you take this and pull it out by itself and then say this applies to anybody? No. Because it doesn't apply to just anybody. In verses 16 and 17, we're told who it applies to. He's talking to the 11 disciples, all of which were ordained ministers. And he tells them to go out and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. You see, if you ignore context altogether, then you've got justification for anybody going out and teaching and baptizing people. But it wasn't spoken to just anybody. It was directed at ordained ministers. All right? Another passage, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12. And he gave some apostles. Well, that would be Peter, John, Matthew, Andrew, etc., we just talked about them. Were they not ordained ministers? Of course they were. The 11 that he just spoke to over in Matthew, they were ordained ministers. He gave some apostles and some prophets. Was John the Baptist ordained? He was certainly baptizing people, hence his name, John the Baptist. He was a prophet. All the prophets were until John. And some evangelists, we're going to see one of those in a few minutes, evangelists were ordained. Um, and some pastors and teachers, okay, Timothy, Titus, all the way down to the modern day. So in this passage, we're talking about people that have been set aside and been ordained for the job that they're going to do. All right? He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfect, here's the purpose, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Edifying means to build up. When you baptize someone, they're brought into the church. Is that not building up the body of Christ? If you baptize 3,000 souls in one day and they're added to the church, did you not just build the church by 3,000 souls? So it's for the perfective, for bringing the saints forward. That's the work of the ministry. Is baptizing not a work of the ministry? Of course it is. Which is one of the reasons that if, if baptism is required for eternal life, then baptism is a work. It's plain and simple. Acts chapter 28, or 21 and verse 8. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and come into Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven and abode with him. You say, what's that got to do with baptism? Well, I'm going to tie it together in a second. I just showed you a passage that showed evangelists in the same list with apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers, right? Now we have the evangelist Philip. Acts chapter 8 and verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, 
and they went down both into the water, both Philip, Philip the evangelist, and the eunuch, and he baptized him. You see, the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, was baptized by Philip, an ordained minister. So that was the reason for that other passage. Acts chapter 21 and verse 8. And the next day, we that were, oh, we, I'm, oh wait, just move forward. That was it. Sorry, I hear I had a note to myself and I didn't pay attention to the note. Okay. So, the first thing that you need is a proper administrator. And I don't know how many people have, over the course of their lives, been baptized by somebody that wasn't a proper administrator. I'm gonna, let me tell you a little story, a little personal story here. When, uh, when I was converted, I, uh, Wendy and I traveled to Las Vegas. We lived in Reno at the time to be baptized by Ben Mott. And, uh, and in talking with him, he told me, you don't need to be rebaptized. You were already baptized as a missionary Baptist, you know, when you were a kid. So you don't, you don't need to get in the water again. And I asked him, well, is it gonna hurt anything if I do? He said, well, no. I said, well, then put me back in the water again. I'd rather start over than, than not. Let's just do it that way, insurance policy, okay? Well, come to find out, the church, the man that originally baptized me was a man by the name of Randy Rudd. And after this, ha after I had been rebaptized by Ben Mott, um, there was a, a uh, it's not a series, there was a, a segment, a segment on the television show 60 Minutes. You ever heard of that? Okay investigative reporting type of a show. And, and this segment dealt with a guy by the name of Randy Rudd, the man that baptized me originally. And through all of their stuff, because he was running some sort of a fraudulent cancer get well center, which was really a real estate scam. Um, and 60 Minutes went out and did this thing on Randy Rudd and what he was doing in, in I think, Marietta, Marietta, California, or wherever it was. Well, come to find out, the man was never ordained. Had I not insisted that Ben Mott baptize me, I still wouldn't be baptized. Because he wasn't ordained. He was a pastor of a missionary Baptist church and somehow had snuck in under the radar. But they found out the guy had never been ordained. So, Talk one up for me, for being insistent. Okay, proper administrator. Next, a proper recipient. You need a proper recipient, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's required. Now again, if, we, if we're gonna pick on Protestants and Catholics that go along with the infant baptism idea, how do you know that they're a believer? How do you know that a baby's a believer? They can't talk. They can't tell you anything. See, this is one of the this is one of the grounds that that the church has always held to, that Baptist churches have always held to, and it's one of the arguments against this idea of infant baptism or baptismal regeneration. You need a believer. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Does that mean aardvarks? <laughs> Ant eaters? Trees? Is that what that's saying? Am I supposed to go teach the gospel to cockroaches? Are they, that's a, they're a creature? Are they not? That's not what the verse is referring to. If you look at... If you run all the, and I'm, we're not going to spend the time to run all the passages this morning, but we'll look at a couple, or I'll refer to a couple. If you look at the places where a creature is tied in with the new birth, you find out that a creature is a new, is, is somebody that's been born again. Example, Galatians 6.15 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new 
creature. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? You preach the gospel to people that have been born again. That's the Now, how do you know if they've been born again or not? Well, the ones that have been born again are going to believe it as, we're gonna, as we continue on. You go preach it to everybody because we don't know who the creatures are. We do know that in 2 Corinthians 5.17 it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So we go out and preach the gospel to whoever, and the creatures respond. Those that have been born again respond to it. So he's not saying that we're required to go preach the gospel to bugs and lizards and snakes and alligators and anything else that's crawling around out there. We're to go out and preach the gospel, period. And when creatures hear it, they respond to it. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized. See what comes first. Believing comes first. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now there are those that will take that to mean, see, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Well, you do. You have to be baptized in order to be saved. But it's not talking about eternal salvation. It's talking about temporal salvation. But there is a salvation, and we're going to get into it probably next week and show you what it is, what you're actually saved from, and what you're actually saved to. There is a salvation, but it's not eternal salvation. This is just a case of somebody being lazy and not running enough verses and coming up with the idea that you have to be baptized in order to be eternally saved because they use that word saved to always mean eternally saved unless, unless it's so obvious that it can't be talking about that, it's talking about something else. But they revert to that always. Um, but that's not what it's saying. First off, if you're preaching the gospel to born again people, aren't they already born again? And the ones that respond and then are baptized, aren't they already born again? And if you're going to say that what you have to do to be born again, if you're going to take the Arminian position that you have to believe in order to be born again, and, and you believe, aren't you already born again? So baptism has nothing to do with you being born again. And we'll see what it is as we continue on next week. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word, here, here's a bunch of creatures, they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I'll bet their arms got tired. Of course, there were a bunch of them there. You know, all the apostles were there, so you had more than one guy doing the baptizing, but 3,000 of them? That's, that's a bunch of folks. Acts chapter 8 and verse 12. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. You see, believing first. You have to be a believer. That's a proper recipient. Somebody that believes. Now, you can't, a baby, you don't know whether they believe or not. How are you going to ask them? If you believe, goo, and then they go, ooh, and so you bab, no. Believe You have to be a believer. Acts chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. And as they went on their way, they came, this is the Ethiopian eunuch again. They went on their way, they came unto certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And this next verse is the one that I've pointed out a few times in the King James study, that the new Bible's erased. They don't want it in there. Because Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so they went down into the water and they baptized him. You see, if thou believest, thou mayest. Otherwise, no. So that verse in and of itself is a proof text that proves that you have to believe. Now if you got an NIV or you got one of these other Bibles, that verse isn't in it. I wonder why. Maybe because it's a proof text that says you have to be, believe in order to be baptized and that doesn't agree with the idea of baptismal regeneration or, or with infant baptism. Acts chapter 16 verse 31 through 34. 
And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. We're talking about the Philippian jailer. This verse is used all the time. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And they put a period right there. But it's not a period, it's a comma. And it goes on to say, and thy house. Now let me ask you a question to all the Arminians out there. If I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, does my wife get to go to heaven as a result of that? Do my kids get to go to heaven as a result of that? Because this verse says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Does everybody in my household get saved because I believe? Or is this talking about a salvation other than eternal salvation? Is it a salvation for someone in the family to believe as somebody else doesn't? Of course it is. Does it not help out if at least one of the parents is, is a believer and is baptized? Of course it does. Now it's not optimum. Of course you would want both parties to be a member of the church. But if, if that's not the case, and one of them is, at least that one is under the protection of God, which makes things better for the entire household, does it not? So, of course, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and the rest of your house will be saved in a temporal sense. Not talking about now. Let's think about where the Philippian jailer was at the time that this happened. He was getting ready to kill himself. It was the law in Rome that if you were responsible for guarding prisoners and those prisoners escaped, then it was death by crucifixion. Nobody wants that. So if these guys had have escaped, I can understand his motivation to pull his sword out and go ahead and do send himself because. I'm dying anyway. And that's why they called to him and said, do yourself no harm, we're, we're all here. We didn't run away. And then he says, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized he and all his straightway and when he had brought him into his house he set meat before them and rejoiced believing in God with all his house the Philippian jailer was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and he was saved and so was the rest of his house but the message here is even if there's just one of you that's still better than none because there is a salvation that comes along with how the children grow up, with some of the trouble that you get through as you're raising your family. As long as there's one, at least there's some hope that God's watching over that and keeping you out of some of the problems that you have to deal with. So you need a proper, um, proper administrator. You need a proper recipient. Number three, a proper belief. You need a belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who died for our sins and was raised again from the dead according to the scriptures. Now, last week in Las Vegas and the week before last here, um, or no, I'm sorry, this week in Las Vegas and the week before last here, I preached a sermon on Jesus is the Christ and laid out exactly who, what it means to believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's what I'm referring to here. That's what I'm referring to. I'm not referring to you believe that, Je that, that Jesus is a, a Christ that, that made the down payment and now it's up to you to work your way into heaven. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you are a believer in Christ, the Christ that we believe in, that paid the final sacrifice, that paid the debt, that died only for the elect, and that all of the elect will ultimately be eternally saved. That's the Christ I'm talking about. There are, I don't know how many Jesus Christs out there. Believing in the Jesus Christ that the Mormons teach is not going to get you in the water. 
believing in the Jesus Christ that the Jehovah's Witness teach is not grounds to put you in the water. Because as I've said many times before, it doesn't take grace to believe a lie. It takes grace to believe the truth. And so to show that you are a child of God, you make a profession of faith in the true Christ. That's the belief that's necessary, okay? That he died according to the scriptures, that he was raised according to the scriptures. Acts chapter 8 and verse 36. We're back to the Ethiopian eunuch again. Verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's a very simple statement, isn't it? But what exactly does it mean? We went over what it means to be the Christ a couple of weeks ago in the sermon on Jesus is the Christ. We covered that then, so I won't take the time to get into it again or we won't get anywhere this morning. But we've already dealt with what that means. If you're going to say that Jesus is the Christ, and you don't know what that means, go back and listen to that other sermon. And that will explain to you what it means when you say that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus Christ, and then that he's the Son of God. That points to the fact that he's divine. He's the promised Messiah. He completed the work that the Messiah was sent to do, otherwise he wouldn't have been the promised Messiah. Remember, he himself said that if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works. So he did the works that he was sent to do. That's what it means to be the Christ. So Jesus Christ, being the Son of God, is divine. Those are the things that are necessary. Those are the beliefs that are necessary. And notice in verse 38, and he, Philip, commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now, I'm going to cover this point a couple of times. Why would both of them have to go down into the water if all he's going to do is sprinkle some water on his forehead? I've never been to a Catholic christening or baptism or whatever you, whatever you want to call it, but I saw it in the movies in The Godfather. And if Hollywood did it, then obviously it's got, it's got to be correct right where the priest draws the stuff on the head and then pours a little water on on the baby's head right why would you have the priest didn't go down in the water why would you both have to go into the water if all you're going to do is flick some water in their face or pour a little water on their head you don't have to get wet in this case they both went into the water and we'll and we're going to cover that in just a couple of minutes um, look at mark chapter 16 verses 15 through 16. And we just, we just looked at this a couple of minutes ago. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth is, and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth and is baptized. What do you have to believe? We just saw that over in Acts, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And we know what that means. Okay? that that's not a name. Christ is not a name. It's a title. And it refers to the work that he did while he was here. He that b believes that and is baptized shall be saved. Those are the, that's what's necessary to be baptized to start with. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein you stand. By the which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. All right, quick test. What salvation is that? By the which also ye are saved. What salvation is it? If you're saved by the gospel message, what salvation is that? It's temporal. It's not eternal salvation temporal salvation. You don't get saved by believing the gospel. You have an evidence that you are saved by believing the gospel, but it's not the means by which you get saved eternally. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, 
how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's what's necessary to believe. So when you put it all together, it is a belief that Jesus is the Christ and we know what that means, the Son of God, that he's divine, who died for our sins and was raised from the dead according to the scriptures. That's what's necessary. And the key word here is according to the scriptures. Not according to the idea of this denomination or that denomination or something else. According to the scriptures. And that's what's required. That's the proper belief. Okay, so we've got a proper administrator, ordained minister. We've got a proper recipient, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got a proper belief. What's next? A proper mode. A proper mode. Immersion in water. First passage we want to look at, Romans chapter 6 verses 4 and 5. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into his death. What does it mean to be buried? It's Memorial Day weekend. Tomorrow there are going to be a lot of people that go out to cemeteries and 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 recognize those that have died for the purpose of defending this nation. And picture in your mind what they're going to see when they get to the cemetery. They're probably going to see a lot of grass and some headstones, right? How many of you think that they're going to see a bunch of corpses laying on the ground, hands folded, eyes closed, with a little bit of dirt on the forehead, like somebody just sprinkled dirt on them. Is that being buried? Does that constitute being buried? Just sprinkling a little dirt on somebody's face? Or maybe pouring a little dirt on the top of their head? So that the rest of the body's sticking out, but just the, the top of the head's covered with dirt? No, of course not. To be buried means you're completely immersed in this stuff. Whatever it be, when you bury somebody, you don't leave them laying on top of the ground and then just sprinkle a little dirt on them and move on. When you bury somebody, you bury them. You completely cover them. And that's what, bab that's what baptism is. It's a picture of the burial of Christ. Now. I know that there are those that will argue, well, yeah, but he was buried above ground. He was buried in a tomb. Buried in a, you know, that doesn't count. Well, of course it counts. It's still dirt, is it not? What's, ro what's a rock made out of? Hard dirt? They build mausoleums. In fact, we have, in New Orleans, they have most of the grounds are above ground. Most of the graves are above ground because the, the water table is about two inches. So they have to build them above ground, and they're called mausoleums, and they stick the body in there. And what's that made out of? Concrete. And then it's usually covered in marble or something, but it's made out of concrete. What's concrete made out of? Dirt. It's hard dirt. When you bury somebody in a tomb, it's the same as burying them in the ground. They're still completely immersed in dirt in one way or another. They're not laying out there in the open with just a little sprinkle on top of their head. Okay, That's the reason the word is used this way. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see, the baptism is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it resembles. And so when you go into the water, you are the filthy guy that just died as a result. You go under the water, and when you come back up, you are commanded to walk in newness of life. Death, burial, resurrection. Verse 5, for if we have been planted together... Now, okay, I will, I will grant you that there are times when 
maybe some, type, some forms of grass that you can just kind of throw the seed out there and be done with it. Of course, the birds will eat most of it. Usually when you plant something, you dig a hole, put a seed in it or something or whatever it is that you're planting and then cover it back up with dirt again. That's usually how it works. If you've got a whole, if you've got a row that you're going to plant, you're going to go out and plant cotton. You you carve a a row into the dirt. You put the seed in, and you come back over and cover it all up. You plant just like if you're going to bury something. You completely cover it up. That's the idea. And if you say, well, plant could be something different. Well, then what? Why are you monkeying with the text? God put it in here for a reason to make the point that this is not something that you just sprinkle a little on, you bury it, you plant it, you put it completely under whatever, whatever it is that you're putting it under. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. You see, the mode is immersion. John chapter 3 and verse 23. And John also was baptizing in Enon, near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. What difference does it make if there's much water somewhere, if, if all you're going to do is sprinkle a little water on somebody's forehead? I got enough water in this cup to sprinkle water on everybody's forehead in this room if I do it one finger at a time. How, why do I need much water? Do the whole room with one cup if I'm going to sprinkle you. I don't need much water. Why would Philip and the eunuch go down into the water? Which is our next verse. Acts 8.38 And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and baptized him. Why has the preacher got to get wet? Why do I have to take extra clothes with me everywhere I go, just in case I end up baptizing somebody, if, if all i got to do is just squirt them with a squirt gun? That'd be pretty good, huh? Get one of those water bottles and just spray it with that. That'd make it nice and easy. And No. You got to get, the preacher's got to get down there too. Get down and do some work. Now the word is, the Greek word that's translated in this is baptizo, which means, the primary meaning of that word means to dip, to immerse, to submerge, to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, to make clean with water, to dip in or under water. The primary meaning of the word baptize is to immerse. That's just simply what the word means. So baptism, the proper mode, is immersion in water. Sticking somebody all the way underneath the water. Now we have one more, and that's the proper result, which is addition to the local church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, Peter had been preaching the gospel, said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? Here Peter was preaching to a bunch of creatures, and this bunch of creatures wanted to know what to do. And notice they were pricked in their heart. There's other passages that refer to people being cut in the heart, and then they usually rail on somebody as a result. Being pricked, and think about that. When your conscience starts to bother you, you, you might be able to understand this, this idea of being pricked in the heart. When it just hurts. You know you're supposed to do something. I know I'm supposed to do something. Not sure what it is or I know what it is and it bugs me. That's what that's what's that's the symbolism of this. It was getting to him. What do we do? How do we solve this? The Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? When they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now the key here is, what's the gift of the Holy Ghost? What is the gift that you receive when you're baptized? What gift do you get? Does it come wrapped in paper? Something that you open over in the corner to get a new toy airplane? What gift do you get when you're baptized? What is that gift? Okay. For the promise is unto you and unto your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So there were about 3,000 of these folks that were baptized and then ended up being members of the church. Okay? And look at verse 47. Praising God, the same, folk, same bunch of people, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, there are people that get baptized that shouldn't have been baptized. There are people that get into the church that don't belong there. And we're, we're told that over and over and over again over, in many of Christ. The parable of the tares talks about those that are in the church. The parable of the ten virgins talks about it. There's all kinds of parables that talk about the fact that there are people that either sneak in or, or sometimes just make a mistake and end up in the church. And when they're added to the church on the church rolls, I mean, we've got a list that's got all the members' names and their phone numbers and their addresses on it, right? And we add everybody that's been baptized. Who does the Lord add? Those such as should be saved. He doesn't add the ones that shouldn't be saved. On his roll sheet up in heaven, the ones that, that, that got in by accident, yeah, they're not added to that one. He only adds the ones that such as should be saved. You see, that's what that verse is taught. We add them all. He only adds those that should have been there. So if somebody shouldn't have been in the church to, to start with, but they're bad, we've had several that we've excluded over the course of the years that we've been here that shouldn't have been here to start with, and but they got in and now they're gone. And so now that they're gone, he didn't have to erase them. He never added them to start with. He only adds the ones that should have been here to start with. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I'm not saying that all the ones that have been excluded shouldn't have been here. Some of them may have should have been here and messed up. But just trying to use the example that sometimes you get people in and, and they shouldn't have been here to begin with. Okay. So the Lord adds daily those to the church that should be saved in addition to the church is the is the result of baptism a water baptism okay now the next thing i want to look at is this and that is that baptism is a figure it it does not bring about anything other than addition to the church and it gets you wet okay it does not give you eternal life. It is not a step required in order to become a child of God. It has nothing to do with that, clearly. Did Jesus Christ become a child of God when John the Baptist baptized him in the water? When God spoke and said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And the, and the Holy Ghost in the figure of a dove landed on his shoulder. Was that because John had just baptized him and he became the Son of God then? No. He was born the Son of God. His baptism is not what made him a child of God. And your baptism is not what makes you a child of God either. 
It's a figure. It's just like when we take communion. When we take communion in this church, it, that's not what makes you born again. That's a remembrance of the sacrifice that Christ made upon the cross. Baptism is something that is done in obedience to God because you're commanded to do it. If you believe, you're commanded to be baptized. Very simple. You either fall into that category and say, yes, I will do what God told me to do, or you don't. Very simple. But it does not make you a child of God any more than that's what made Jesus Christ the Son of God. Doesn't work that way. All right? So it's a figure. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. I don't know how much more plain you could be because he puts it right here in the text. The next statement, the parenthetical statement that's in there, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God. How much more plain does it need to be than that? It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not what regenerates somebody. It's a figure. Romans 6, 3 through 5 shows it to be a figure or a likeness of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's the figure. But it's not something that regenerates someone. Here we have Romans 6, 3 through 5. Know ye not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into, into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. There's no actual death of Christ in baptism. This is just strictly a figure figure of what of his death and resurrection right Romans chapter 6 verses 9 through 10 knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more death hath no more dominion over him for in that he died he died unto sin once but in that he liveth he liveth unto God so he didn't die every time somebody gets baptized he died once we don't kill him every time we get baptized. It's not some new sacrifice. It is simply a figure of what he did. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 24 through 27. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye, as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this breath and drink bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Again, this is a figure. Communion and baptism, the two ordinances in the church, they are both symbolic. They are both figures of something else. They are not the actual crucifixion of Christ, death, burial, and, and resurrection of Christ. They are figures. Okay? Let's look at another figure so that you can see this. This is another, Paul calls it an allegory. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 24 through 26, because there is, you see there are many things in the scripture that are figures, and this is one of them. Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Now, he's talking here about the son's of Abraham. To put this into context, he's talking about the sons of Abraham. He had the one son that was of the handmaid, Hagar, 
You remember that? You remember that? It, his name was Ishmael, and he was cast out. And then he had the son of promise, which was Isaac. Right? In Isaac shall thy seed be called. So that those two sons of Abraham, this is what Paul's referring to here. And he says it's an allegory. You can look at what happened with them and you can see, so you can get teaching out of this by looking at the situation. It's a, that was a figure. It happened, but you look at it and you can see something, some teaching coming out of it. Okay, and he says that the, the first covenant, the Mount Sinai, which that refers to the law, right? The Ten Commandments were given at Mount Sinai. The law, that economy, that system, gendereth to bondage, and that's Agar, refers to Agar, the handmaiden who gave birth to Ishmael. Okay, what happened to Ishmael? Do you remember? He was cast out of the camp. Finished. Move on. Done. We're done with you. Get on down the road. Okay? For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. You see, this was a figure. This was a figure. This was an allegory. This was a story whereby the old Jewish economy is being represented in this, in this story by Hagar and Ishmael. And when, when the time came, they were sent out and God was finished with them. But the Jerusalem that he's concerned with in this day and age is the Jerusalem that is above. The Jerusalem that is in heaven. The Jerusalem that is made up of a whole bunch of people. Some Jews, some Gentiles, all brought into that one temple that's being built as, but where the building stones are actually the people in the church were built into that temple. That's the Jerusalem that God's concerned with now and has been ever since Paul was talking when he wrote this passage. That's the Jerusalem that he's concerned with. That's the Jerusalem that all the prophecies that haven't been fulfilled in the Old Testament relating to Jerusalem are pointing to. They're pointing to that, not to Hagar and Ishmael, which was the Jerusalem over there in the Middle East somewhere. Okay? That's an allegory. It's a figure. He was using that as a figure. Well, communion is a figure. It's something that we do that we look back at something else. Baptism is a figure. It's not something that, now while you truly do get wet, and while in communion, you, you do actually eat a little bit of bread and you do drink a little bit of the cup, right? I mean, there, there is a physical thing. But it's not something that now all of a sudden brings new life to you in the sense that you are born again as a result of doing communion or born again as a result of being, of being baptized. It's, it's strictly figurative, okay? Um, let's look at another. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. And now why, this is, this is, uh, um, can't think of his name right now. He's talking to the Apostle Paul. Paul had been struck down on the road to Damascus, um, Ananias. And his name's Ananias. And he's now talking to Paul because Paul the, is finally the, he's, he, he now knows what he's supposed to do. And he says to him, now, why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? Another one of those passages that some people will use to try to say, well, you've got to be baptized in order to get rid of your sins. No, it's figurative. It's a figurative washing. Baptism symbolizes a figurative washing, just like when we wash feet in the church. Does that wash your sins away? Does that take care of the sins below your ankles when we wash feet? Is that, what, is that the purpose of that? No. That's a symbol. That symbolizes two, two main things. One, the continual washing that Christ does as you sin in this life. 
We're told over in 1 John that, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's what he does. So when, so when we walk through this filthy world and get dirt on our feet, so to speak, Christ is continually washing that dirt off of our feet as we're faithful and just to, to ask him to do so. And number two, since it's the brethren in the church doing the washing, it symbolizes the fact that the brethren in the church help us get through this life in this sin-cursed and dirty world also. But it's a figure. Just like this is a figure. This washing away of your sins is figurative speech. It's not, it's not literal. That's not what, what causes you to be born again. If it were, then salvation's of works. It's that simple. It's just, very, it's just that simple. If this is a requirement to be born again, then salvation is by works. So, and if you're going to believe that salvation is by works, go pick another church. Go find a church that teaches that salvation is by works. Join the Catholics. Join the Presbyterians or the Lutherans. Methodists. Church of Christ. Any of them. Go join them. They believe that stuff. We don't. Okay? So baptism symbolizes the washing away of sin by the death of Christ. He's the Savior, not us. Now let's look at, an, let's look at something else. Look at Genesis chapter 6. And I want you to see something, uh, again, baptism being a figure. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 17. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. A couple of things. Literally, literally there was a salvation in the ark. There was a literal salvation for Noah and his family relative to coming into the ark. Was that eternal? Was that a condition that he had to meet in order to be eternally saved? No. No, literally there was a temporal salvation involved in Noah going into the ark. Right? We're told long before he even started on the ark that he was a just man. Justified years before. He was a preacher of the gospel. He preached for 120 years. Clearly he was that had nothing to do with his eternal salvation. It was a temporal salvation. But it's a figure. There's a figure of an eternal salvation in this. And the figure is this. Look at Genesis chapter 7. Turn there while, I'm, while I make this real quick point, and then we'll go over there. The salvation of Noah in the ark was a covenant salvation. And it was specified for only a certain number of people. And God decided who those people were going to be. It was going to be Noah and his wife and his sons and his sons' wives and a bunch of animals. Okay? Nobody else. That's how it's a figure. So there was a literal temporal salvation and a picture of a of eternal salvation wrapped up in both. Okay? Genesis chapter 7. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. You see, he'd already seen that he was righteous before he called him into the ark. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female, of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. While this salvation pictured 
Well, while it was actually a temporal salvation, it pictured a covenant salvation, the same of which you could say Christ, when Christ paid the price upon the cross for all of those whom God had selected before the foundation of the world, it was, so the ark, it covers both aspects of this, and I, I, I know I'm not going to do a very good job of explaining it, but, but it covers the aspect of the temporal salvation, because clearly it was not, was not eternal salvation. It saved them in this world, it saved them in this life. And we're going to get into it a little bit heavier next week, but I don't want to get there right now. But on the other hand, it also pictured that covenant salvation that is eternal salvation, where the numbers that, are, that were in, put into the ark, those that were welcomed into the ark, were only those whom God had chose. And it was a very small percentage of the, of the planet, quite frankly. There were eight of them. That was it. We'll get into that a little bit more next week and, and continue on with this study. But for this morning, we're going to go ahead and close here because to get into the next bunch would take quite a bit longer. So we'll go ahead and stop for this morning and we'll pick this up again next week, Lord willing. Let's uh, stand and be dismissed in prayer.